Let me, uh, let me go ahead and start with a word of prayer, and then we'll get right to the word. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus, the Son of God, we come to you with grateful hearts for all that you are and all that you've done. We recognize that we're sinful people, Lord, and we recognize that Jesus is an all-sufficient Savior. As you've encouraged us thus far in this corporate worship service with singing and prayer and uh, words of encouragement, we pray that now you bless the preaching of your word to further encourage our hearts, to strengthen us in our faith in you, to deepen our love for you. Lord, have grace and mercy on your people this morning. In your holy name I pray, amen. Well, this is the fifth message in our Upper Room series uh, where we're... Uh, preaching through John 13 through 18, a section that for the most part takes place in an upper room. Uh, that was Todd's creativity. <laughs> he joked about it, so I thought I, I could do. But you don't have to laugh, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> now today, uh, just so you know, today I'll be in John chapter 14, 15 through 31, the section that, uh, that Taylor just recited a moment ago. So you can go ahead and turn there in your Bibles if you haven't already done that. In the early 1980s, Coca-Cola had dropped in its market share in the soft drink market to below 24%. And that was low enough that the CEO felt that drastic action was needed. He, uh, so he took one of the biggest risks in the history of marketing and, and uh, corporations, really. Uh, he authorized a change to the formula that the company had used since its inception in the late 1880s. The old standby would be replaced by a sweeter formula called New Coke. It was introduced to the world on April 23rd, 1985, and the old formula would no longer even be produced. The CEO said it this way, it would be New Coke or No Coke. However, as uh, those of you who were alive uh, back then know, the public was not uh, so amenable to the replacement. They did not find it to be an improvement. Initially, sales were about even with what they had been beforehand, but it didn't take long before there was a tremendous public backlash, people protesting and writing letters and making phone calls against this, this new formula. And so after a little while, <clears throat> sales started getting affected by that because people, even though they might have liked the taste of the new Coke better, there's all this public sentiment against it, so it, it made it less popular to drink. So on July 11th, 78 days after introducing New Coke, Coca-Cola executives announced that they would return to the original formula, which of course they've produced uh, ever since then. The lesson here is that when you take something from something that people love from them, you need to replace it with something that's at least as good, if not better. And of course, uh, Coca-Cola didn't do that, so they had to reverse course. Now in this section, we're talking about the disciples having to lose something. They, Jesus told them he was going to be leaving, so they were about to lose his physical presence. But Jesus comforted them with the promise that they would receive something even better than his physical presence, the indwelling Holy Spirit. Uh, in the Upper Room Discourses, Excuse me, uh, but before I get to the, uh, the passage today, let me remind you of its context just a bit. Uh, you remember in John chapter 13, <clears throat> Jesus had gathered with his 12 disciples in the upper room to eat the Passover meal. It's what we refer to as the Last Supper because it was the last meal that Jesus had before the events that uh, culminated in his, his betrayal, arrest, uh, and uh, uh, crucifixion. And while they were at the supper, you'll recall that at one point he made it clear to Judas Iscariot that he knew Judas was going to betray him. Now the other apostles didn't catch on to this, but Judas knew exactly what Jesus was saying. And then Judas got up and left. And after he left, the, Jesus then began to share with the rest of the apostles, the ones that were faithful to him, began to share what was about to happen and began to share really deep things from his heart. <clears throat> one of which was some very sad news for them, and that was that he was going to be leaving them. Now, you can just imagine the uh, emotions that they would have felt. This was their friend, their master, their teacher, their Messiah, and he was telling them, pretty soon I won't be in your life. So in the first half of chapter 14, which Todd preached through last week, he comforted them with this promise. I'm going to go prepare a place for you, a home 
and one day I will come and bring you back to be with me. Now we get to the section that I'm I'm preaching through this morning, and he further promises that he's going to comfort them by sending the Holy Spirit to them. My apologies, my throat's a little bit weak this morning. Uh, One thing I'll note here before I get into the sermon, this passage is doctrinally very dense. Uh, All throughout these upper room discourses, I'm sure Todd had the same challenge. There is so much there that could be unpacked that's not possible to do in one sermon, and and I probably don't even have the mental faculties to be able to unpack it all. So what I'm going to do is concentrate on one particular thread of truth. That's why uh, I've titled this The Gift of the Holy Spirit. What I'm going to be focusing on is what I think is the dominant theme of this passage, the, uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit. However, as we're reading through, you may read some things that raise questions in your mind that you would want to study and read about further, so I'll just encourage you to do that. Uh, Get a commentary on John. There's online stuff, uh, you know, just infinite uh, if you want to study further. But all that to say that that's why there'll be sometimes when I'll read a a verse and you'll go, man, I don't know why he's going going into that. It's just simply the uh, time constraints. So I'm concentrating on the Holy Spirit this morning. I want to point out four things that this passage tells us about the Holy Spirit. The first is this. The Holy Spirit is given to those who love Jesus. The Holy Spirit is given to those who love Jesus. Look with me again at verses 15 to 17. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you And will be in you. Jesus promised his disciples that he would ask the Father to give them another helper who is the Holy Spirit. But right before he made that promise, this is so interesting to me that he starts off this section with this phrase If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now think for a minute about what that statement means. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. It means that obedience is the demonstration or the evidence or the proof of someone's love for Jesus. Another way to put it, thinking about it kind of uh, in a reverse order, is that love is the foundation, the motivation, the fuel, the source for obeying the Lord. Now think about how fantastic that is. We don't obey the Lord in order to cause ourselves to love him. We love the Lord, and out of that love, then we obey him. That is the proper and purest foundation for obedience. All of us have had authority figures in our lives that demanded obedience for reasons other than love. Uh, How many of you guys or girls ever had a coach who was the type that just wanted to make sure you feared them above all else and therefore you'd do what you need to do? Anybody? Rough, tough coach, ex-military maybe? A lot of coaches approach things that way, don't they? If you, uh, well, I'll give you another example. All of you guys that own a car. You know that every year you invest some time and money in getting that car inspected and getting its registration renewed. Now, how many of you do that because you love our state government? (laughs) Nobody does that, right? The reason we do that is because we don't want the result of or the punishment that comes from not doing it. We don't want the ticket. We don't want to pay the fine. So that's why we do it. We're doing it to avoid punishment. But if you obey someone because of your love for them, then the very act of obedience, even if it is unpleasant, brings you joy. So when I am in line at the uh, time at Lube to get my car inspected, I am not feeling joyful at the waiting for to get my car inspected at the time I've had to spend to do this because I don't love our state government. I'm just doing it because I want to avoid punishment. But... If, for instance, your elderly mother called you and said, I need you to rake the leaves in my yard, you would go rake the leaves in your yard, not because you fear her, but because well, you may fear her. I don't know. <laughs> Mothers can they have their own power, right? But the main reason you would go is because you love your mother. And so even in the act of raking those leaves, even if you hate raking leaves, even in the act of that, you can feel joy that you're, bringing, uh, that you're pleasing your mother, that you're bringing her delight, that you're helping her out. So the proper motivation, the proper foundation for obedience is love. That's where God wants us to obey out of. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. 
This is such an important point that Jesus actually mentions it five times in this passage. Verses 15, 21, 23, 24, and 31. <clears throat> but that raises another question. How well do we need to keep his commandments in order to show that we really love him? Nobody has a guess? Kidding. I like what John Calvin said in his commentary on this verse. He said, a perfect love of Jesus can nowhere be found in the world because there is no man who keeps his commandments perfectly. Yet, God is pleased with the obedience of those who sincerely aim at this end. I like to summarize it this way. God is looking at direction, not perfection. He wants the direction of your heart to be toward him. He wants your aim to be to obey him, even though you aren't perfect in your obedience. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. One other thing I'll point out about this, and I am going to get to the Holy Spirit, I promise you. Uh, one other thing I'll point out about this. He just said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And what had he said about his commandments just a few verses earlier? He had said, a new commandment I give to you, love one another as I have loved you. So that's the commandment that would have been foremost on their minds at this time. And what he's saying is, you love me, you keep my commandments by loving your other brothers and sisters in Christ. So by the, us showing love to our brothers and sisters in Christ, we are also showing love to God and we are obeying his commandments. And it is those people, the people that love Jesus, the people that therefore love the other uh, believers <clears throat> that keep his commandments. It is those people who are the beneficiaries of all these blessings that he is about to mention. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments and... I will uh, ask my father and he will give you the Holy Spirit. Okay, so uh, the Holy Spirit is given to those who love Jesus. Uh, a couple things I'll mention about that. First of all, that the Holy Spirit is a gift. In verse 16, we hear the promise. I will ask the father, he'll give you another helper. But I want you to notice that the Spirit is given as a gift. Now, uh, I realize that just because Jesus said the father would give the Spirit doesn't mean, necessarily mean that he is a gift. Last uh, May, I was at Certified Autoplex in Carrollton, Texas, and they gave me a Chrysler Town and Country minivan. But they only gave it to me because I first gave them a check for the cost of that minivan. So that was not a gift. I did not thank them profusely for their gift to me. It was an exchange, right? So just because Jesus said, well, the Father is going to give it to you doesn't mean necessarily that it's a gift. There could be a cost attached to it, right? But the reason we know that the Spirit is a gift is because Jesus doesn't put any cost on our receiving the Spirit. If you love me, if you're one of these people who loves me, I will ask the Father and he will give you the Holy Spirit. Now, I was reading a commentary, commentary last week, just horrified me because what they said was, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So Jesus was saying, if you keep my commandments, then I will ask the Father and he will give you the Holy Spirit. But think about that again. It goes back to, okay, so how well do we have to keep his commandments before we qualify for this gift? 50% of the time, 70% of the time, 90% of the time. Would anybody in here raise their hand and say, yeah, 50% of the time I'm in perfect obedience of God? Of course not. So that cannot be the case because then he would never give the Holy Spirit to anyone. And just in case there was any doubt in your mind, the Spirit is explicitly referred to as a gift three times in the book of Acts. Now, the reason I wanted to harp on this, that the Holy Spirit is a gift, is that first of all, it gives us a further motivation to praise God for his love and generosity. Just as Jesus is a gift, just as salvation is a gift, the Holy Spirit is a gift. And he is a divine gift. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Spirit is God. God is giving us himself. <clears throat> Romans 5.5 5 says, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given unto us. And I came across this commentary, J.A. Fitzmaier, I've never heard of, but he said this. This verse, talking about the Spirit, uh, assuming God's love being poured in our hearts through the Spirit, refers to the divine energy manifesting itself in an overwhelming embrace of once godless creatures, listen to this, who are smothered with his openness and concern. It is the manifestation of God's giving of himself without restraint, in a way unparalleled by any human love. God gives us the gift of himself. 
God is the prize. God is the joy. God is our great reward. There's a natural temptation, as I mentioned earlier about this commentary that horrified me, to see verse 17 as a consequence of keeping his commandments. But of course, that wouldn't be a gift. That would be earning wages. Romans 4, 4 says, Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. Uh, sometime last year, the, we have a heat pump at our house to provide the heating and cooling. And the uh, outside unit, the, uh, the fan stopped turning. So I assumed the motor had gone out. So I called my dear friend Eric Aiken to come out and look at it, and he had to replace something. Uh, I can't remember what. Anyway, when he was done, he handed me a bill, and I gave him money to pay for that bill, and he did not say, thank you for this gift of money. He earned that money that I'd given to him. Now, I'll be honest, actually, he did say thank you because he's a polite person, but it was not a gift. I wasn't just like, hey, Eric, here's, here's some money. It was at wages for what he had done. So if the Spirit is not a gift, if the Spirit is wages, we'll never get there. We will never earn the Spirit because we certainly can't be good enough to earn God himself dwelling within us. Praise God that he doesn't require us to earn the Spirit. He gives us the Spirit as a gift. So in addition to the Spirit being a gift, now I want to concentrate for a minute on this, this word helper. He said, Jesus said that the Father, I'm sorry, Jesus said that the Father will give us another helper. Your version may say advocate, it may say counselor, it may say comforter. The Greek word is parakletos, and it's not easily translated into English, which is why different translations try different words. Uh, in fact, that's why sometimes you'll hear sp people refer to the Spirit as the paraclete, which is just an English transliteration of that Greek word parakletos. What it means is one who is called alongside to provide help. That's why helper is often used. Uh, since the term also applied to someone helping another in legal proceedings and criminal charges, the word advocate is, uh, makes sense as well, someone who pleads on our behalf. In fact, this same word is used of Jesus in 1 John chapter 2, where he says, if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, which underscores what Jesus said. He was going to send another helper, another parakletos, because he is a helper. Jesus is a parakletos as well, a comforter, counselor, and advocate. And here we're getting at one of the most comforting truths that the disciples could receive about this change that was coming. Jesus is telling the disciples that he, the Spirit would be everything that he was to their lives. Everything that Jesus was to them, a guide, a teacher, a comfort, a source of strength, a source of truth, a source of friendship. Everything that Jesus was in their lives, the Spirit would be. So he's saying, my physical presence is going to be replaced. It is going to be taken away from you. But the Spirit that is going to be sent in my place, he will replace everything that I am to you in my physical body. <clears throat> David prayed in Psalm 51, take not your Holy Spirit from me. Jesus said that the Spirit would be with us forever. And that underscores one of the differences between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. When the Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, it was not the first time He had ever been active on earth. All throughout the Old Testament, you see the Spirit active. It was not the first time that He had even been dwelling in someone the, uh, the uh, Bible sometimes referred to the Spirit filling people even in the Old Testament. But what was happening was a more intimate relationship that the Spirit was going to initiate and a forever relationship. In the Old Testament, it tended to be the Spirit would come on someone or in someone. And then, as it were, the Spirit would depart <clears throat> in this new covenant that Jesus purchased for us. The Spirit comes and He lives with us forever. Forever. On our good days and on our bad days, when you loved others well and when you were a jerk, the Spirit is with you always. Now, one of our normal desires is that we would experience the presence of the Spirit in a way that can be apprehended by our senses. And I think you all would join me in saying it would be awesome if there was just a flame floating above my head at all times. So I look in the mirror and be like, spirit is still there, spirit is still there. Or if like when I knelt to pray, I would hear this sound of a rushing wind and just shake the windows in my house or something like that. We would like that. We would love for there to be some tangible way that we knew that the spirit within it would be within us. But 
That isn't what Jesus promised. However, he did promise that the Spirit would be with us and in us forever. And that is what we can stand on. When you feel the rush of joy and exultation, when you feel the depths of sadness, when you feel absolutely nothing, you can hold on to the promise of the Spirit because Jesus promised it. Jesus who cannot lie. He is with you. He is in you. Now much more could be said about that, but I'll move on to the next point. In addition to the Holy Spirit being given uh, to those who love Jesus, the Holy Spirit manifests the presence of Jesus to those who love Jesus. And by the way, you'll notice uh, all of these points end with those who love Jesus because Jesus was emphasizing our love for him, spilling forth in our obedience to him. So I think it's right to just keep that in mind. Okay, this is for those of us who love Jesus. Look at verses 18 to 21 with me. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. And that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. So right after promising that he was going to leave, but he was going to ask the Father, and the Father would send the Spirit. Then he says, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Now, some students of Scripture believe that what he was referring to are those appearances he made after his resurrection. Because he was taken away from them when he was arrested and then crucified and buried in the tomb. But then he did come back to them after he rose from the dead. And over a period of 40 days, appeared to them, ate with them, talked with them, and taught them. But I don't think that makes sense with what he said about, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. It wouldn't be very comforting to say, I'm going to come back to be with you. Well, for 40 days, and then I'll leave you as orphans. He's saying, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you in some permanent way. So others believe he's referring to his second coming. But that wouldn't make sense either because he didn't return during the disciples' lifetimes. So again, it wouldn't make sense for him to say, I won't leave you as orphans. I'll come to you. Well, in a few thousand years, I'll come to you. The third option, which I think is the most convincing, is that I, I think he's saying that he will come to his followers, followers through the presence of of the Holy Spirit in them. He will come to them spiritually, not physically. The Holy Spirit would be given to them just 10 days after his ascension, and the Holy Spirit would be with them their entire lives, which makes sense of this statement that he wouldn't leave them as orphans, but would come to them. He would come to them spiritually through the Holy Spirit. Now, the disciples didn't catch this at the moment, and I think we can hardly blame them. Jesus often spoke very deep and cryptic truth. So then one of them speaks up and asks the question. So look with me at verse 22. Judas, not Iscariot, just so you know, it's not the bad Judas, the other guy. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Because, of course, he had just said, the world will see me no more, but you will see me. So Judas is like, well, I don't understand that. You're going to come back and we can see you, so why won't the world be able to see you? So Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and the father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words and the word that you hear is not mine, but the father who sent me. He said he would come and manifest himself to them, but he said the world wouldn't see him. So Judas says, how can that be? And then, Judas, and then Jesus gives this answer and look at that answer for just a second. He did not directly answer his question, did he? Jesus would so often answer questions in a way that would make you think for a bit before you arrived at the answer. And that's what he did here. He begins by pointing back again to obedience as the sign of love for him. And then he says that he and the Father will come to the one who loves him and make their home with him. This makes it obvious that what Jesus is talking about is a spiritual return to them, a spiritual reality, not a physical one. The father does not have a physical body, so the father won't come to them physically. And since he added that he would make their home with his followers, it logically follows that he's talking spiritually because Jesus physically couldn't make his home with more than uh, one home at a time, right? There's a, a preacher that he's been dead for some years now. He was a longtime preacher at Peninsula Bible Church in, uh, I think it was in the Bay Area of California. Ray Stedman was the name his name, but I love what he says about this. 
Here he puts his finger on what is probably the most wonderful truth about the coming of the Spirit. His primary work is to make Jesus real to his disciples. The mark of the Spirit-filled life is an ever-deepening consciousness of the reality of Jesus Christ. Verse 20 says, in that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you and me, and I and you. There will be a certainty, there will be a knowing that the Spirit gives you. And so the Spirit conveys or mediates or makes certain or brings the presence of Jesus to us. The Spirit gives us certain knowledge of our union with Christ. He witnesses to us that we are children of God. He strengthens our faith in who Jesus is and what he has done. And he spiritually brings the presence of Jesus into our lives. Which reminds me of, I don't know if I have enough time to go off on that pet peeve. Uh, there are times, uh, and I'm going to credit Jordan Johnson with first putting me on this line of thought. There are times when people will say, this happened to us at the Rise, kids. Y'all remember because I harped on it Wednesday night. The, the uh, musical team gets up and they say, okay, you guys ready to get into the presence of Jesus? Okay, so who can bring you into the presence of Jesus? Nobody on this stage. I can't bring you into the presence of Jesus. Todd can't bring you into the presence of Jesus. Tyler and the, the worship team, they can't bring you into the presence of Jesus. It is the Spirit of God who brings you into the presence of Jesus. And if you love Jesus and you are one of his, then you are always experiencing the presence of Jesus. Whether you're feeling it or not. Okay, I'll end that soapbox. Move on. The Spirit manifests the presence of Jesus to those who love Jesus. Thirdly, the Holy Spirit teaches those who love Jesus. Look with me at verses 25 and 26. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Now, when Jesus was with, those, with the disciples, he was constantly teaching them, constantly giving them truth, constantly saying important things. And now that he was about to leave, these 11 men were going to be the main ones responsible for passing that message on, for spreading the good news about Jesus, for teaching others about Jesus and what he was about. <clears throat> but they weren't walking around with voice recorders. And it doesn't even ever mention that they had notepads. I don't even know if they wrote this stuff down. So how could they be sure that they were going to get this right? Once Jesus leaves, how can I be sure? Okay, did Jesus say this or did he say it that way? You remember that time we were walking through that grain field? How are they going to do that? Jesus said, the Spirit will bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. On January the 13th, Todd preached on John 13. How many of you remember the main point of his message? I didn't either. My apologies, Todd. I didn't either. I had to look this, <laughs> look this up on the uh, website. Aspire to a lower position. Talking about humility and putting ourselves lower than others. Now that's not a reflection on Todd's preaching. That's a reflection of our faulty human memory. We forget things very quickly. Our memories are very weak. That was less than a month ago. And most of us, if not all of us, have forgotten it. So you can see why the disciples might be a little worried that once Jesus leaves, that they're going to have to carry on this message and do it accurately. So Jesus comforts them by saying, the Spirit will teach you everything. The Spirit's going to enable you to understand a lot of these things that I said that you didn't understand before. And he's going to bring to your remembrance everything that I said that you need to know. Now, verse 26 is actually a promise specific to the apostles. So that they would be, a, <clears throat> be able to confidently lead the early church. And most importantly, so that they would be able to write scripture accurately. You'll remember that while he was still alive, the disciples often misunderstood things. But once the Spirit came, you see throughout the book of Acts when they would stand up and say, Jesus said this and here's what this means. There was a, there was a confidence and an authority that was given to them by the Spirit. So they could be confident that they weren't forgetting some important lesson Jesus taught. They knew that the passage of time wouldn't warp their memories about him because the Spirit would make sure that that didn't happen. Now that's one of the reasons that we can have confidence in the New Testament scriptures. Because there was supernatural involvement in their writing just as there was with the Old Testament scriptures. Now since that was a direct claim, excuse me, a direct promise to the apostles, we can't claim 
we can't lay claim to that. Okay, nobody can say, you know what? I don't ever need to read the New Testament again because the Spirit's going to help me remember everything Jesus ever said. <clears throat> that doesn't happen with us. But we can be confident that the Spirit is teaching us as well. One of the functions of the Spirit is to teach. 2 Timothy 3 says, All Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for correction, reproof, instruction. I didn't write it all down. The other one, too. <laughs> that the man of God may be complete or competent. Now, this, that passage was written specifically to a pastor. Uh, that's, that's the phrase, man of God. But it's safe to conclude that just as the Spirit teaches pastors through the Word, He also teaches those of us who are not pastors. 1 John 2.27 says that the anointing we receive from Jesus teaches, uh, teaches us about everything. And the anointing we received is the Spirit. So the Spirit of God in us, He teaches us about spiritual matters. He teaches us about the Scriptures. <clears throat> and primarily that is how we learn, through understanding the Scriptures better. He also uses other people and events to help us understand the truth, circumstances of life, and that kind of thing. Okay, the final aspect I want to highlight in this text is this. The Holy Spirit brings the peace of Jesus to those who love Jesus. Look with me at verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced, because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. Now, I mentioned that there would be a lot of things, a lot of questions that may arise as you read through this that I'm not going to be able to touch on. And this section is filled with a number of those. But I do want to mention one because it can be extremely important in your understanding of God. You notice at one point he said, if, if, if you guys love me, and basically what he's saying, if you really understood and loved me, if you really understood what I was teaching, you would have rejoiced that I said I was returning to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. This verse has been used through the years by heretics to teach that Jesus is not divine or that he is something less than the Father in his divinity because he said the Father is greater than I. But earlier in this same book of John, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. At one point, John chapter 8, he said, before Abraham was, I am, taking the divine name there. After his resurrection in John 20, the apostle Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God, and Jesus didn't stop to correct him. The Bible clearly and repeatedly teaches that Jesus is fully divine. So when Jesus said, the Father is greater than I, he was not talking about in nature or essence. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Spirit of, is God. <clears throat> They're all equal in nature. However, he was talking about his current position. See, when he uh, came to earth to become a man, the Bible describes it as emptying himself. He lowered himself to our stat status, taking on the likeness of sinful flesh. And while he was in that position, he was positionally less than the Father because he's walking around as a man. And his glory that he and the Father shared from all eternity was not being displayed. So the Father is experiencing greater glory and the Father is in a, in a higher position because the Father is in heaven reigning above all and the, and the Son is currently uh, walking around as a man. <clears throat> so he was not saying that the Father is greater in essence, that I'm 80% I'm God, the Father is 100% God. What he's saying is the Father is greater than I am in glory and position. And when I return to him... I am going to once again share that glory that we have had from eternity past. <clears throat> okay, back to this promise of peace. Jesus said he was giving them peace, and then he added, not as the world gives. Does the world give peace? To a degree, right? Yeah, to, to a degree. Uh, at this time in world history, as a matter of fact, when Jesus was alive, they were ex the, uh, the Roman Empire was experiencing what was called the Pax Romana, peace of Rome, and it was a period of, uh, of about 200 years when the Roman Empire had, had conquered, you know, all of that area in the Mediterranean and the Middle East, and there, were, there was very little warfare, 
and there was a very stable society. So people, for the most part, were living in peace. <clears throat> and Jesus said, not as the world gives do I give. So think about Rome's peace. How did they establish that peace? With the sword, yes. They conquered people. That's why they weren't at war with them, because they conquered them and stationed garrisons in their cities. So, of course, they couldn't easily rebel or go to war. So the peace that the world gives at that time was accomplished through violence. Now, the peace that Jesus gives also was accomplished through violence, but not him doing violence to others, him receiving violence in himself. And, of course, the other thing is that the peace that the world gives is temporary. Because the Roman Empire, as I hope all of you know, did not last. They eventually uh, fell into lots of wars as well. The barbarians, yay for the barbarians, they uh, brought Rome down. <clears throat> the peace that the world gives is not lasting and it is not independent of circumstance. So the peace that you can get outside of Christ can get completely taken away by tragedy, by war, by trial, by sickness. The peace that Jesus gives lasts forever. Now you may be thinking, I love Jesus, but I often don't have any peace. I often do have my peace taken away by tragedy or the trials of life. Maybe you struggle with depression or anxiety or panic attacks. Maybe you're thinking, I haven't felt the peace of Christ in longer than I can remember. I hear that, and I, I don't dispute that, but what I'm talking about is not the feeling or the sense of peace, but the reality of the peace that Jesus brings. I'm talking about the confidence that the Spirit gives you in God's Word, the certainty that Jesus died for your sins and rose from the dead, the certainty that you are at peace with God, adopted by God, beloved by God, the certainty that He is always with you, the certainty that one day there will be an end to all suffering and sin, the certainty that one day you will be delivered from this mortal body to a new immortal body to enjoy unhindered, perfect fellowship with God forever. That is the peace that I'm talking about. When you feel it, when you experience it, when you have a sense of it, yes, that is glorious, and praise God for that. But even when you are not feeling it, even when you are in the midst of that trial, you can rest in the fact that because of what Jesus has done, you are at peace with God, and you are living in the peace of what is going to come. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. Jesus bought that peace with his blood, and he gave that peace to those who believe in him. And it is the Holy Spirit within us that ministers that peace to us and maintains that peace within us. Again, not the feeling, but the knowing. Philippians 4 says, do not be anxious about anything. <clears throat> and by the way, I think Todd may have pointed this out in the past as well. I used to always think of that as a command. And so I was like, okay, I also need to repent when I'm feeling anxious. But I believe the sense is more like if your child is scared and you were to put your hand on them and say, don't be afraid. You're not saying, stop being afraid or I'm going to spank you. You're saying, I want to comfort you. Don't be afraid. So he's saying, don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I know that our certainty and our confidence can weaken, but in those times, I urge you to listen to the Spirit by reading and meditating on the Scriptures. Take your doubts and your fears to your Heavenly Father and ask Him to help you experience the knowing, the confidence, the peace that only He can give. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit is given to those who love Jesus. He manifests the presence of Jesus to those who love Jesus. He teaches those who love Jesus, and He brings the peace of Jesus to those who love Jesus. The main point is this. The Holy Spirit dwells in believers and makes Jesus real to them. The apostles were blessed beyond description to be able to be in the physical presence of Jesus. To walk beside him, to talk with him, to eat with him. But after his ascension to heaven, they were given something even better than his physical presence. The Holy Spirit himself. In his physical presence, Jesus cannot be with us all the time. But through the Holy Spirit, he is with us all the time. And he's closer to us than is physically possible. In this life, we won't get to experience the physical presence of Jesus. But if you are a believer, you are already experiencing the spiritual presence of Jesus through the indwelling spirit. 
What a truth. What a truth that the Holy Spirit has given to us and makes Jesus real to us. Now, let's think for just a minute about how we can respond to this message. As is our custom on Sunday mornings, I've, I've come up with some ideas for you. First of all, I will thank God for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Praise God that he gave us the Spirit. God himself, he gave us himself. Being forgiven and being given the righteousness of Christ are blessings that bring us into fellowship with God himself. That is the ultimate good news of the gospel. The prize of salvation is not just escape from the punishment of hell. It is fellowship, union with the living God. Thank the Lord for securing your redemption, which allows you the blessing of the gift of the Holy Spirit. A divine living person who now lives in you. A second response, I will read through John 14, 15 to 31 and write down all that it tells me about the Holy Spirit. Like I mentioned earlier, there's a lot that I couldn't get to in this passage. As a for instance, I wrote down 12 things that the, about the Spirit that were mentioned just in verse 16. And I'm sure you could come up with more. Uh, students, if you come up with 13 by Wednesday, there may be a prize for you. A little incentive there. <clears throat> Worship God this week by spending time learning more about him and being reminded of truth or being reminded of truth you already know. Praise God for everything about the spirit because that now is yours. The spirit is yours. The spirit is within you. Ask the father to help you see his work in your life. Thirdly, think of an unbeliever that God has placed in your life and show them Jesus is real by meeting a need. Since the Spirit is working to make Jesus real in your life, you are now able to make Jesus real for other people. Is there someone in your life that doesn't know Christ? Do they have a need that you can meet? It doesn't have to be some grand, glorious thing. It may be something very mundane, helping them uh, clean out their gutters in this uh, winter time, or mowing their lawn, or helping them with a meal or childcare or something like that. If you help meet that need... Let them know that you're doing it because you love Jesus and want them to experience his love as well. <clears throat> Obviously, don't put it that awkwardly. They'd probably not want to talk to you again. But the point is, let them know that, it is, it is, that you're sharing the love of Christ with them. Okay? I, I have been on a few trips with David Fisher where we have gone, uh, for instance, Eight Days of Hope last year. Gone to help people recover from tragedy or help them fix their house or something like that. And one of the things he always stresses for the team is that we are there to share the love of Christ with these people. These people aren't some project. It's like, man, if we don't see, you know, 20% of these people get saved, we wasted our time. No, we are just there to show them the love of God. And then we let the Lord work through that. Keep in mind that you're doing it to express his love, not to get some leverage in their lives to guilt them into coming to church. At the uh, end of service here in just a few minutes, we're going to have uh, some people here at the front. So I encourage you, if you have any issues you would like prayer about, any questions, if you don't know the Lord and you would like to know the Lord, any of the people up here at the front would be happy to uh, share that with you. If you need prayer about something that's heavy on your heart, <clears throat> I urge you to take advantage of that. So let's go ahead and stand, and I'll close this in prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for the gift of the Spirit. Thank you, Lord, that, that once again you give us something that we couldn't possibly earn. But out of your generosity, out of your love, out of your concern for us, when you knew you had to leave, you asked the Father to send the Spirit to take the place of your physical presence. And now everyone around the world, the multiplied millions who love you, can know that the Spirit of God lives within them and He is working to make you, Jesus, real in their lives. He is manifesting the presence of Jesus to them. He is teaching and guiding and bringing them your peace. Lord God, I, I pray today that you would extend your grace to everyone in this building. Lord, I pray that they would have a newfound sense of the reality of the Spirit in their lives. They would walk in the confidence knowing that God himself is dwelling in them because of the work of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray also that you would bless each person this morning with a special measure of grace. If there are any who don't know you, draw them into your loving fellowship to come to know Jesus as their Savior. And for those who do know you, I pray that you would bless them with a burst of joy at being reminded of who you are and what you've done for us. 
In your holy name I pray. Amen. God bless you all. You are dismissed. Prayer team, you can come on forward.